from the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey folks, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. I'm your host, Paddy Danda, and today I have one of my good friends rejoining me for another episode. It's Francesco Bianchi. Francesco, thank you so much for joining me again. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Paddy, for having me again. Always a pleasure talking with you. Oh, no, you're welcome. It's like you and I, we exchange messages on LinkedIn and we're, we're making these plans all the way through LinkedIn and then... It's really nice when we do actually get to to talk, at least remotely, on the camera. So I always enjoy our conversations, and it's a pleasure to have you back. So, Francesco, which superpower would you like to bring to the show today? I would like to talk about curiosity. People will be curious to hear about why we find it so interesting as a superpower. I was going to say, there's, a, there's an English saying, curiosity kill the cat. I don't know if you've ever heard that. I really hope not, because the big community that I'm <laughs> co-leading at work is called CAT. <laughs> so I really hope not. It's a community of agile technologies, hence the acronym CAT. So let's keep it as a saying. Plus, kittens and cats are super cute. We don't want to kill them. Yeah, they do have nine lives, so hopefully they're all right. But yeah, there's a, there, there's a negative connotation sometimes around curiosity. And I think traditionally, you know, we've often been pushed towards not being so curious and just listening and being you know told what to do and acting upon that so it's really interesting to take a different perspective on that so tell me about curiosity why is it so important i think everything starts for me from the fact that i tend to be bored very easily i believe it started as a sort of way a countermeasure to boredom a countermeasure to feel that your life is plain or doesn't have a sense, doesn't have motivation. And and I had this instinct inside that I kept quiet for a long time, precisely for the reasons that you brought up. So you need to be in your place, you need to do the things that you are told to do, you don't need to ask too many questions, you need to be careful about this and about that. And, and, and at a certain point, for me, there was too much. And that kind of corresponded to the moment where I started exploring agility. So for me, the two topics are very much related. And that this strong instinct that tell, told me, ask questions. And at the beginning, yes, like a cat, I lost a few lives. Curiosity did kill me in a certain way professionally. But then I started learning how to ask those questions and uh, to explore my curiosity. And that has been a life-changing experience for me. Life-changing experience? How so? It affected me at all levels, and it's somehow, it's difficult to describe it. It's not something that I do intentionally, but I allowed myself, for example, to be curious about people. And all of a sudden, people started talking to me. And not in the normal way, like we are talking now, this was intentional. And not even in, you know, when you meet a stranger, you cross paths with someone on the road and you smile to them, they smile back. It's literally, I am can be standing in the middle of nowhere and someone may come close and approach me. Or I, I remember being in New York for my 40th as a gift, and I was in this food market. And there was plenty of people around, and someone approaching me to ask if they could try my food, a complete stranger, not something I would have expected in a metropolis. And, I, and, and then after that, I was with my wife, and she called out this was absolutely weird, and for me, it was absolutely normal. And we looked. We tried to pick someone else going through the same experience and it didn't happen. And I did a lot of thinking about that. And I realized that it's simply the difference between me and other people is that I'm curious and I'm not hiding. I do want to know what your day was like. I do want to know what you like. I do want to know what your emotions are. And when you talk to me, I'm not shy of hiding it while I have been for 30 years of my life. And I moved from being kind of alone in my corner to be constantly connected with people these days and that thing alone is a transformation a big transformation on how i interact with the world but if i take it to a business context or or if i remove myself if you want from the social context 
Curiosity has helped me change my job entirely. I was a developer before, convinced that I want to be a software architect for my entire life and I want to deal with people, code, and then discovering that there is an entire world outside of there, which is what I'm doing now, which I love much more than what I used to do before. And the discovery piece there, for me, translates into attending one training after another one and discovering new areas that I can study and new skills that I can pick up. And while they're connecting with people and getting to know them and building a network and, and that grows massively. I was going to say, if I think about learners or serial learners, your name is at the top of the list in terms of my network. I really look forward to your LinkedIn posts, especially when you talk about some recent learning you've been on, because you really bring your perspective into why was that learning so important? How did it help you? How did it get delivered? What were some of the elements um, that really made it a great learning experience? And, and I love that about you because you really do help a lot of people with that. I know you, you know, from interactions, but we're not childhood friends. We're not people that have had a long history together. But as a sort of an outsider, I really connect with you just even on that because we have things in common. You have this curiosity for learning and I'm quite curious about learning and then we're like-minded in that respect. So I, I think where I'm going with this is with someone on the street or a stranger, how do you build a connection with them through curiosity? Like if you don't have a history with them? I, I think it's something irrational that happens. You can't hide your true emotions unless you put effort into it. I stop putting effort into hiding myself. So when I see someone and I may be curious about the way they move their eyes or the the shape or color of their glasses, of why they're standing there instead of being one meter on the side where the, the zebra cross stripes are on the street or whatever the thing is, anything that sparkles my curiosity, I don't hide it. So I simply look at them. And that's something that I believe we have lost becoming adults in the current society, where there's a sort of shame in showing your true emotions and being too close to people. That may sound creepy. You don't want to do that. What, you don't know what they can do. They may be dangerous. And I stop removing all those layers and allowing my body to express my emotion. And I think people simply pick that up. In a way, it's easier to be noticed because you are interested than not to be. And so where do you think that came from in you, Francesco? Because if I think back to my childhood, I was quite a big introvert and I wasn't really encouraged to come out of my shell and speak to lots of people. I remember my first day at university, there was one other guy sat in the corner of the room and there was me and everyone else was talking away. They were networking on our very first day. And there was just me and this other loner who <laughs> were kind of on the sidelines. And it just so happened I struck a conversation with this guy and he became one of my best friends. And, you know, we still stay in touch now. But I, I guess, is this something that you're born with? Is it something you develop? Like, how have you built this superpower? Surprise, I'm an introvert myself. <laughs> Uh, and I can recognize myself in the story that he just told. And I believe I simply grew tired of that. I wanted to be heard and I started empathizing with other people who I discovered along my life and my path that they share the same feeling. Very often you don't know how to interact with people, but you would really like to. And so probably for me, it started when I started being a scrum master and taking care of everyone in the team, making sure that everyone was listened to, everyone was included in the conversation and realizing that the moment you showed some curiosity, some interest in their opinion, they opened up, they felt safer and they started talking and they were typically the people bringing the most thoughtful and inspiring thoughts to the table. Uh, they just didn't know how to voice them. And so I said, well, th there must be something in here. 
it can be happening just during team meetings that happens on Thursday 4.30 in my office in the ping pong area. There must be something more. Let's go and try outside. And I started asking questions in meetups, actually. Yours is one of the first ones when I started connecting with people. And I said, I think everyone is curious and everyone shares a lot of questions. They, they are simply too scared to ask. So I'm going to provide the answer before they even ask. So start connecting with people because many wants to be heard and, in, and notice that the interaction and be part of a flow and fun. And I started posting on LinkedIn and starting to see that actually, like you and me, many people are interested in learning because it's a big investment of time and money. And you want to do the right choice, but you don't know who to ask to. Where do you go? That was my doubt at the beginning. And that's what I started to answer preemptively. And seeing the response that gave me confidence in saying, yes, that's the right thing to do. And so, Francesco, you're a coach. And I guess that role requires you to be very curious because you've got to ask a lot of questions. So if somebody did want to strike a conversation or build a connection with perhaps not somebody they know so well, any tips and the types of questions you might ask? So I'm biased here. I live in Ireland. I've been living here for seven years now. And the big conversation opener is, what's the weather like? And and I come from Italy. And the second, and there the biggest conversation opener is, what did you have for lunch or for dinner yesterday? Or what did you have for over the weekend? And And those are absolute truth and things everyone can relate to. They are typically fairly safe as a conversation opener. Everyone will have some opinion of some sort and shape, even if it's just to say, oh, again, it's dull, it's gray, it's raining, whatever the thing is. It gives them a chance to start, to break the ice on a safe ground, and maybe already share something about them. And from there, it's just a build up. I know it may sound very silly, but it's actually incredibly powerful. I was in in a training in October last year in Denmark where I had the pleasure of meeting our mutual friend Karsten and and I was surrounded by 20, 30 people and I didn't know how to start a conversation. And I ended up having the first one asking, so what's in what, what are we gonna have for lunch? That's the only thing I felt safe sharing with someone. Two hours later, I was super friends with everyone. I love that. I love that. There's been times where I've been in a crowd of people that I feel I've got nothing in common with whatsoever. Actually, an example just popped into my head. When I was at college, so I was probably 16, 17 years old, during the summer, I had a holiday job where I was working at a local council in one of the local offices. And it was where they used to design the menus for schools. And it's an office full of all females. I think they were sort of probably about eight, nine females in the room. They were all sort of middle-aged. So I, I was the youngest in the room. And I literally had nothing in common. Like they would come into the office, they'd talk about their children, talk about their marriage problems. Like there were some really deep conversations going on in that room. And there's me who, my life was like, it was like a computer game. I used to watch certain TV programs or films and there really wasn't any sort of synergy there in the room. I don't remember what conversations we used to have, but I remember that was a really tough moment because I'm thinking, how do I, how do I make a connection with these people? How do I get in on the conversation? And often I used to use my youth mindset because they'd be talking about, well, you know, kids, they think this way and we feel that this is the right thing. And I'd say, well, hey, if I was at school right now, this is what I would be thinking. And straight away, they've almost got their customer in the room with them. And (laughs) we started off from there and then we evolved. But it can be really difficult, right? When you're in a situation and everyone around you is completely of a different demographic or of have a different interest or culture to you. And it's how do you break that ice? And I love that. Really simple. You know, what are we having for lunch? That's something that everybody cares about. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, food for sure. 
So, Francisco, in terms of curiosity, I guess it's something that we can use in lots of different ways. So one is about meeting people and connecting with new people. We talked about learning and being curious about learning. I'd really like to focus on the learning aspect because, you know, for you to be successful in your career and just generally successful, where do you seek your inspiration to become more curious about a particular topic? How do you go about that? Especially the fact that you are often talking about some cutting edge things that you're getting yourself into, some cutting edge practices when it comes to coaching or other forms of learning. Where do you seek your inspiration from? I'm almost visualizing a chain. You talk to someone and they talk about something that makes you curious and you start exploring that. And by exploring that, you meet another person and they talk about something else that makes you curious and you start exploring that and that can continue forever. Um, I actually should share, you now see me attending plenty of trainings, like an awful lot, <laughs> but it was almost again tra against training until a couple of years ago. I said, ah, oh, I can always read a book that's much cheaper, doesn't use as much, as much time. But I, then I bumped into someone who was really inspirational, Alistair Cockburn specifically, and did one day training with him and he completely blew my mind. I said, oh, this is a completely different level. This is something I, I had never experienced before. It's not me sitting in a room listening to someone talking for eight hours. It's me doing with someone challenging my thinking and providing me that platform. And I started exploring a little bit more. And the moment you start attending one training and then another one, it becomes almost addictive. There's so much content out there that, yeah, one life is not enough. Even if that was my full-time job to attend trainings, I wouldn't be able to, to attend all of them. Where exactly do I find inspiration? LinkedIn is where I find most of it. There are some people that I don't necessarily follow, but uh, I'm in contact with, and you're one of those. You always post great stuff. This is not a paid for plug, but Visual Jam is a fantastic source of inspiration. Scott Witt, uh, if I may share another one, is a great other meetup where I'm seeing great authors. It's a great way to experiment if you like an approach of working and a way of explaining. Go in, do one hour, one, one hour and a half, session with someone and if you like it if you come out of it energized then maybe consider going book some training with them that's what i did with Eder martinez for example i couldn't care the less about lettering and my flip charts were just messy but i really like their style she's absolutely amazing so i booked a, a training and i did it as a couple activity with my wife and we loved it Somehow that type of job, script booking, completely different application of the same concept. But they become an activity we, we did together. And and I loved it. And I discovered just attending a meetup. Fantastic way to discover something. If you connect with people sometimes and you show what you're interested in, sometimes they will come to you and say, you know what, I attended this thing. I think you would love it. So sometimes you don't even need to actively search. The information come to you. I wouldn't dismiss something that many agilists tend to do. I wouldn't dismiss at all the all the branch of certifications. I think there's a lot of value there for many reasons, one of which is for me, when there is some studying connected to it, otherwise it's not a certification. There must be some homework and some test at the end. Um, it's a great way to keep yourself focused and to do some learning. Now, because of all the effort required, if you do your research beforehand in picking the right training provider, that's in itself a discovery process that will allow you to discover many things about the topic that you're going to study. So you're already doing some pre-work and the offer of providers. And by doing so, you may bump into other options uh, that are incredibly interesting, but you never even thought existed. One thing, that I remember when I left high school and probably even university, I don't think I really had a great learning experience in both high school, college, and, and as I said, university probably. And with the exception of maybe one or two teachers, but generally I wasn't, I had no appetite to study any further. 
I remember even saying to some of my friends at the time, I said, I'm so glad <laughs> I've got my degree and I never have to study again. Like that was my mindset back then. And I just saw myself going into work and pretty much now practicing my art. And I look back and I think, how wrong was I? <laughs> because <laughs> with that mindset, I don't think I would have got very far at all. But it was because I don't think I had really experienced that amazing learning experience. Now, as you know, you know, the field of work I'm in now, I work for one of the, the biggest tech training organizations in the UK. My whole profession is about learning and training. So the, the tide has really changed uh, in terms of myself. But going back to what makes a great learning experience? So you mentioned, you know, Heather Martinez, she is absolutely amazing. What is it about some of these trainers that makes the experience so good that gets you so excited about the topic? I, I know it's a little bit, it's a tautology is answering with your question. I think it's, they make you excited. You leave the room being more excited uh, about what you've studied compared to how you were when you entered. For me, the one, well, the two things that I want to see, and I wouldn't be able to choose between the two, is passion and competence. I want someone who's skilled about what they are teaching, because I know I will try to the goals and I will ask the difficult question. Uh, and I admire someone who who has the knowledge and the experience to back up the explanation. And I'm also brave enough to say, well, I, I actually don't know this, but they have the wealth of knowledge uh, to bring to the table and they have passion for that. It's not enough for you to have done something for 10 years and you are not able to transmit that passion. And maybe this goes back to my journey in trying to remove filters from emotion. People who allow those emotions, their true love for what they are teaching to transpire and to reach me. And so that gives me energy to explore more on the topic. And they have enough material to give me so that I can explore. Uh, those two things are incredible. Then, of course, the structure of the training has a lot of impact on how it's perceived. But that, I believe, is mostly a technicism. Everyone can learn that. There are techniques that you can adopt. You can even get a training coach if you want, or an expert that helps you build in the right structure. But the experience doesn't come cheap. It takes a lot of years and passion. You either have it or not. In terms of building those connections with people, how important is it that you surround yourself with a diverse group of people? So... I know you're an agileist, but do you always seek your inspiration and curiosity from agile people or do you venture outside of that circle and how important is that? So I, I'm incredibly glad the change that COVID, uh, COVID has forced on us. In-person trainings are amazing and as much as possible, I would like to do more of them. But I live in a relatively small island, Ireland. I wouldn't have so much easy access to fantastic, the best thought leaders and the best trainers in the world. But together with them, there is the diversity where they can come from, but also the diversity of the people joining the session. I remember before the pandemic, running sessions in my office, having all people living in Dublin, not even Ireland, just Dublin. Well, now in the meetups that I run, you get people from all over the world. You can get someone from the US, an old friend from Dublin, and someone from India, all in the same session. And they bring very different perspective. And the learning for me is amplified there, because when you are within your group, of course, more or less, you can expect to get the same similar type of perspectives. But the moment you open up to the entire world, you're, I was going to say invaded, that sounds bad. Uh, you are enriched by a, a multitude of different views. Um, I'm not that good into actively seeking for different input. I like that now in, in the space of visual thinking, there is naturally a quite diverse crowd. Yes, everyone is passionate about drawing, and a lot of people come from an agile background, but I actually was on a vocabulary training, and there was a person coming from the environment of law, 
which is a very different one for me. And I picked up on a slightly different session, always about visual thinking, someone who's running a startup for financial and, and accounting. So very different field. And you learn also from them. Oh, yes, I can relate to that. I was going to say, I just through the visual jam and thank you for your kind words. It's been amazing just seeing that diversity across the board. I think one of the ones that blew me away was somebody who was a medical doctor was on one of the sessions. And that was for me quite interesting because I wouldn't have thought doctors would care about visuals and visualization, but you know, she was someone who was really passionate about this. And then I checked out her blog and she talks about how you know, doctors should do more of this. And it was, it was really interesting and eye-opening for me. But yeah, lawyers, that would be interesting. Can you imagine, I don't know, you're fighting a case and there's a judge sat there and you're explaining your point by doing some kind of visual or using visual techniques to, to help. That would be really amazing. Francesco, just wrapping up then, what sort of two or three big tips would you give someone who may be that introvert, you know, someone like we were way back and somebody who perhaps doesn't have the confidence as such to strike that conversation with people to show their curiosity. What two or three things could you suggest they do as a starting point? There's a very tough one that may people may dismiss, uh, but I think it's very important. And it's to start truly believing that you are interesting. Someone, a lot of people will be interested in what you have to say in the person that you have, in the experience that you've had. And so by just sharing anything, literally anything, you will find someone who's interested, who will find incredibly valuable what you have done. Of course, there are different venues and different places, but regardless, everyone is incredibly interesting for everyone else. When you start from that place of love for yourself, it's so much easier than to have a conversation. And with that in mind, you could potentially, yes, talk about anything. A couple of conversation starters that are very simple are food, weather, but in any context, you will find a topic that is probably relevant for that context. Do you like board gaming? There's going to be some meetup around board gaming. You can start and go in there. You can practice in a safe environment. You can go to watch a football match and start talking with the person you have on the side. Actually, it's a daily if daily is too much, maybe a weekly or monthly challenge, you could force yourself to start a conversation with a complete stranger as a way to train your conversation skill and confidence skill, if you want. And it's incredibly scary, but it's not that difficult and it's incredibly rewarding. You shared the example before of how you managed to connect with an office that was completely diverse and how as a very introvert person, you met your one of your best friends in, in a party. That's what everyone has access to if they believe enough in, their self, in themselves and they're courageous enough to connect with people. And going back to how we started, be curious. Just show your curiosity to people. Ask about how they feel. Maybe not as your first question, so how do you feel today? But as your second or third, show them that you care. They will open up immediately in ways that are incredibly surprising. People need to feel that someone is caring about them. So just be curious, ask them, how's your day? Nice. Thank you so much for that, Francesco. I was going to say one of the reasons that I do podcasting is because I'm curious. It's a way for me to meet some really interesting, diverse people and just have an excuse to ask them anything I want. Like I've literally got a golden ticket in that situation, provided we built up, you know, some level of understanding and rapport, I obviously wouldn't ask you about, you know, all of your bad habits or anything like that, but there's an opportunity there to delve into areas that I would never be able to ask these people on the street because they just don't have that rapport with me to be able to ask some of those things. So as you mentioned, start off safe. And then as you get to know that person, you can probe in other directions and yeah, it could be so enlightening. And it's such an amazing experience when we're speaking to someone that we wouldn't normally get the opportunity to talk to. 
and we go in these directions and we don't you just don't know where the conversation is going to lead which is the exciting part of it i think yeah uh -huh. i absolutely agree and i thank you for all the work you're doing you helped me you satisfied a lot of my curiosity through your work <laughs> oh francesco honestly we haven't paid francesco today i will buy him a few drinks next time we meet for sure for all this kind words <laughs> <laughs> but only in return for some Italian food, some of your amazing Italian food, because it's been so long since I had a good Italian. <laughs> <laughs> we will organize that. Perfect. Way. Perfect. So Francesco, thank you once again for joining me on this episode. I hope listeners take on some of those tips because I think they're fantastic. Those small steps, I think, can then lead to, you know, much bigger things. And you just don't know where that curiosity is going to take you. Hopefully, curiosity doesn't kill the cat, as we mentioned right at the start, and it's actually going to open up a whole new world for people and new opportunities. So thank you once again. Thank you.